Well, good morning. We're going to follow this pathway to the woke worldview series in, in preparation for what we're going to do in just a couple of weeks. Uh, this is the uh, penultimate uh, lesson in this particular um, short series, introductory series, and it's dealing with existentialism. Uh, existentialism is something that uh, came about in the, through the Enlightenment, through a rejection of the naturalism, a rejection of uh, nihilism, but it created its own uh, problems and they're still with us today, very much with us today. As far as definitions, uh, when we look at nihilism, it's basically that there is no intrinsic meaning in the universe, everything is meaningless, it is pointless to try to construct our own meaning as a substitute. And so there are a whole lot of negatives in nihilism, and of course people can't live by that. They have to come up with something else, and it's hard to deny uh, nihilism if you've already rejected uh, the naturalistic viewpoint, or you come to the um, understanding that uh, we are in a uh, cosmos that has, uh, that is just matter and energy, it has no meaning, no ultimate meaning, and our ultimate uh, goal or um, presence will be death, and that's the end of us. So we need to move on from there, and so what has come up in the uh, realm of ideas is existentialism. The belief that through a combination of awareness, free will, and personal responsibility, one can construct their own meaning within a world that intrinsically has none of its own. That's the atheistic viewpoint, or certain knowledge is unobtainable, and that's the theistic view. So we're going to uh, focus more on the, um, the theistic existentialism, but I wanna cover an overview of the atheistic because that's where we are in much of our world today. So the goal of existentialism, the most important goal of existentialism is to transcend nihilism, uh, to come up with some excuse because nihilism isn't uh, very positive at all. Uh, nihilism is the problem of our age because there is no uh, real meaning for us. So every important worldview that has emerged in the last 100 years has had the goal of transcending nihilism or our lack of teleology. Teleology is purpose. People do not feel like they have an eternal purpose anymore. And if they do not have God in their world, then there is no eternal purpose that they can see. And so that turns toward nihilism. And that's a road that most people don't want to go down. So they've turned to existentialism. And existentialism claims to have solved the problem, but uh, when we look at it, it really hasn't. It's just pushed it off to a different uh, level and it uh, doesn't solve it at all. There are two basic forms of uh, existentialism and these forms are dependent on the relation to previous worldviews. Uh, existentialism, is not really a full-fledged worldview. It's more like a parasite. This is an interesting idea. Atheistic existentialism is a parasite on naturalism. It rejects naturalism or because naturalism says that there is no meaning and it tries to cope with it, but it ends up being more uh, meaningless. Theistic existentialism is really a parasite on theism. And there are um, aspects of this uh, existentialism that uh, reject theism as we know it, biblical, uh, biblical Christianity especially. And that's what we want to focus on. Okay? Remember that theism uh, developed into uh, deism or was split as people looked at God as the one who set things up and then left it alone. And so it's all up to us now. But that uh, then devolved into naturalism because uh, naturalism says that, uh, well, we don't know if there's a God. We know that there's a natural world. We know that there's the cosmos. 
but we can't uh, see God in the cosmos. And so all there is is the, 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 co the world, matter and energy. And that, if you take it to the uh, full extreme, it comes to nihilism, a rejection of all meaning. Because if you're just a cog in the will of matter and you really don't matter in the universe, then there's a problem. And uh, nihilism uh, is the pathway that, uh, that ends that realm. But when you reject nihilism and you try to come up with something else, existentialism uh, makes its presence known, but that in itself, as I said, does not solve the problem. So let's look briefly at atheistic existentialism and then we'll focus on the theistic uh, existentialism. It was developed in order to solve the problem of a naturalism that led to nihilism. It affirms all propositions of naturalism except those relating to human nature and our relationship to the cosmos because we don't know what will happen um, except that we don't have any hope in nihilism. Existentialism's major interest in our humanity, Sire says, James Sire, uh, says, uh, how can we be significant in an otherwise insignificant world? And everybody wants to be significant. Everyone wants to be uh, uh, remembered. Everyone now wants to leave a legacy of some sort. Um, and it's really interesting to what extremes they will go to in order to do that. Naturalism had emphasized the unity of the two worlds, the objective and the subjective. However, materialism made humans nothing more than objects and thus opened the door to nihilism. Existentialists took a different route though. They didn't want to go down that pathway. And so they emphasized the disunity of the two worlds, objective and subjective, and put the subjective first. They put themselves first. Uh, self is the um, focus of the existentialism. This is the core of existentialism. Listen to this quote by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. If God does not exist, there is at least one being in whom existence precedes essence, a being who exists before he can be defined by any concept, and this being is man. So, the objective world is a world of essences, but humans are not human until they determine what they will be. People make themselves who they are. So just pause for a moment and look at the world around us now. What, uh, what do people fill their minds with? What is most important? How do they uh, live in this world? They live for themselves. They are the focus of the world. Everything has to come back to them, whatever TV show they watch, uh, whatever um, they think about their future, whatever they think about their uh, legacy, it all hinges on who they are, their own, um, their own kingdom, so to speak. And that's where everybody is uh, involved, or it seems. Well, here's a comparison chart on meaning, just to kind of pull these together. Nihilism, atheistic existentialism, theistic existentialism, and biblical Christianity. First of all, the question, is there inherent meaning in the universe? Nihilism, no. Atheistic existentialism, no. Theistic existentialism, maybe, but we must have faith to believe this. Uh, exis uh, theistic existentialism uh, says that there is a God. But there are a lot of doubts too, and they have to kind of look within to fill in that gap. They have to depend on uh, their own uh, ability to believe, and it goes back to self. Whereas biblical Christianity says, yes, there is meaning, and God created the universe with a purpose, and we find our true meaning when we find the true God. What about this question? Can we create real meaning ourselves? Create meaning. Nihilism says, no, there is no actual meaning to create. It's very consistent. Atheistic existentialism says, yes, this is all we can do to avoid nihilism. We can't 
accept nihilism. So we have to create our own meaning and we are the center of that meaningful existence. Well, theistic existentialism goes a little bit further, says yes, by faith in meaning beyond yourself. So by in faith in this God who's supposed to be out there, we hope that he is, but uh, just in case he's not, we're still gonna live um, our life with that uh, particular uh, understanding. Whereas uh, biblical Christianity says, no, we cannot create real meaning. Real meaning comes from belief in an actual God. We look at reality, we look at truth as having a rational basis. And so there is a difference between these two aspects. Third question, is the pursuit of created meaning possible? Uh, nihilism says no, even creating meaning in the end is meaningless. So again, it's consistent <laughs> with this uh, core. Atheistic existentialism says yes, this is the goal of existentialism, to create meaning, because you have to have meaning in order to, uh, to exist. Otherwise, what is the purpose of existence? Uh, even if you have to make it up, it's better than the other uh, aspect, and that's nihilism. Theistic existentialism says, yes, uh, the, pr the pursuit of created meaning is possible. And this is the goal of theistic existentialism, to create meaning for your life. And faith may enter into that, hopefully. Well, biblical Christianity says true meaning is created by God. We can share in this meaning by fellowshipping with God. He directs that. He is the purpose. He is the goal in our life. We want to uh, live with him forever, worship him. And that brings us core meaning, true meaning. Um, and what about the, uh, the next question? Can we solve the problem of meaning? Well, nihilism says no. Atheistic existentialism, yes, by creating your own meaning. Notice where that goes all the way through, focusing on yourself, even if there is no real meaning in the universe. It's reject rejecting nihilism and trying to come up with your own meaning. Theistic evolution, theistic existentialism says uh, to this question, yes, by creating your own meaning through faith, uh, you can find meaning, but the emphasis is on yourself still. Whereas biblical Christianity says, yes, by trusting in the God who gives meaning to our lives, we can find meaning. Uh, but the emphasis is on God and the true meaning of the universe created by God. So there is a realm of difference in this comparison, uh, but um, existentialism uh, came out of a rejection of nihilism, but it doesn't come close to biblical Christianity. So let's see how it works out. Uh, the final part is to realize that uh, in the subjective or objective view, the first three focus on subjective whereas the biblical Christianity looks to the objective world that there is a God, he created this world, we are part of the creation, and we have an object to worship that is worthy of worship. Uh, and that's the difference. Okay, how far beyond nihilism? Does atheistic existentialism transcend nihilism? Uh, it tries to, but fails because it cannot get beyond individual humans who cannot provide a basis for a transcendent morality. We are stuck, we don't know, we're in a box and we can't see outside that box. We don't have the perspective of um, theism that believes in a God that can give us perspective and even uh, inject meaning through revelation. And that's where biblical Christianity wins out because we believe that there is an outside um, uh, uh, entity that can um, give us a better sense of what is in our box. And that's the two-ism of Peter Jones, that there is a God who is outside of our world and can give meaning to our existence inside of this box that is our world. Sire says this, by grounding human significance in a subjectivity, it places it in a realm divorced from reality. And that's what's happened. We've uh, re rejected this reality in trying to create a world of our own. 
In the end, atheistic existentialism goes beyond nihilism only while a person exists. Beyond that is nothing but death, and so it's basically the same. Now think of uh, the many people in our society today who have rejected God. They're still searching for meaning. They rejected nihilism because they don't want to go down that road, but they're stuck in an ex uh, atheistic existentialism. They're trying to create their own meaning. And they all want the same thing. They all want to be the top of the top of the mountain. They all believe that they uh, deserve to be at the top of the mountain. And uh, if uh, somebody else is there in their place, they need to go ahead and be equal at least. That's the uh, point of equity in some sense. Okay, what about theistic existentialism? Uh, it was developed in the 19th century as a dead orthodoxy, as Soren Kierkegaard tried to revive the dead orthodoxy of the Danish Lutheran Church. Um, he succeeded in some ways. It was not until after World War I that existentialism became significant, and this was because nihilism had finally taken a strong hold on the intellectual world and began to filter down to the common man. And that's where we are today in many ways still. Theistic existentialism accepts theism's answer to worldview questions, nature of God, man, sin, salvation, future state, etc., in their own way, self-focused. However, the existential version of theism emphasizes the human nature and our relation to the cosmos and God rather than focusing on God or the cosmos. So again, the focus is on how we fit in. Uh, so it's the study of man. The study of man is man, not God, they would say. Man is the focus. Thus, the filter for theistic existentialism is the way that theology intersects anthropology, the study of man. Study of man supersedes theology, which is the study of God. And that has created many, many problems. So, uh, Sire says this about the first aspect. Human beings are personal beings who, when they come to full consciousness, find themselves in an alien universe. Whether or not God exists is a tough question to be solved, not by reason, but by faith. So faith becomes the, uh, the standard, uh, the goal, the, the filter through which all things are measured. Reason is put aside. And that creates its own problems. Theistic existentialism does not begin with God, but it may end up with the same conclusions, but not necessarily. The emphasis is on the self-awareness of individuals. Again, that self aspect. In a world where existentialists say they, that we can never have all the data, every person would be a theist who would be a theist must choose to believe, must choose to believe. So it's focused on uh, what you can do as a person. This is the leap of faith that Kierkegaard and others say is the radical act of faith that must take place. But again, it's self-focused. It is a subjective act and not necessarily verifiable or transferable. It's your experience. And that's why experience has become so important to uh, people who are in this aspect of Christianity or theism. For the believer, it may be all they need, however, for them. Um, they don't need the, the greater um, revelation. How many Christians today, I would ask, are theistic existentialists in that they place their uh, whole belief on their experience that they had and not on the, uh, the soundness of the gospel or the rationality of the gospel or the truth of the gospel because they have doubts about that. Um, and so they focus on their own feelings. So number two, the personal is the valuable in existentialism, the I thou versus I it. Um, like atheistic existentialism, there is an emphasis on the disjunction between the objective and subjective. The subjective becomes the all important. Theistic existentialists emphasize the personal as a primary value and there is a desire to erase the sense of alienation felt in the world. So where's the balance? That's what we want to know. Where is the balance? Uh, well, think of the depersonalized column uh, 
as representing dead orthodoxy. And this is what Kierkegaard fought against. Um, and then the um, personalized column representing a live theistic existentialism. So you can see that existentialism has some good to it. Um, it tried to correct this dead orthodoxy, but it's created a focus on self rather than God. Sin, depersonalized, breaking a rule. Repentance, admitting guilt. Forgiveness, canceling a penalty. Faith, believing a set of propositions. Christian life, obeying rules. That was dead orthodoxy to Kierkegaard. Uh, the personalized uh, form is the uh, existentialist view. Sin is betraying a relationship. Uh, it is, but not just on the horizontal, and very much on the vertical if we look at biblical Christianity. Repentance, sorrowing over personal betrayal. Forgiveness, renewing fellowship. Faith, committing oneself to a person. Christian life, pleasing the Lord, a person. But it's still too much focus on yourself. Renewing fellowship with each other. Sorrowing over personal betrayal on a horizontal level. You haven't felt that depth of sin, and that's the problem. Sin is too much out of the picture. The, um, the fullness of how we rejected uh, God in our own lives, and we're trying to cover it up. So existentialism, theistic existentialism, really averts uh, the, real, um, the real necessity to know God fully. So how does existentialism enhance a Christian's beliefs? We see that it personalizes it, but only horizontally and not enough vertically. And um, then there's number three. Knowledge is subjectivity. The whole truth is often paradoxical. This is very important. In atheistic existentialism, knowledge often becomes the knower, or rather the individual decides what the facts relate what truth is. You are the arbitrator of truth. In theistic existentialism, the truth is often paradoxical, resolved in the mind of God, but not resolved in the human mind. There's still a lot of the questions, so you end up saying, well, I can't know this, so I've got to rely on what I can understand, and so it's still self-focused. Uh, it is to be lived out, they say. God, I really... I, God, I rely completely on you. Do your will. I'm stepping out to act. I am stepping out to act. And so in the comparison of these things, atheistic, atheistic existentialism said it's all about me. Theistic existentialism says it is all about myself in service to God. And biblical Christianity says it is all about him. He is the focus. God is the focus. So there is a difference. I'm not going to go through this chart, or which is a, a John frame, frame square, but I just wanted to point out that uh, we live with paradox. Biblical Christianity has a lot of paradoxes, and here's one between free will and, um, and divine sovereignty. Free will, this is what existentialists kind of focus on. I have free will. I make the choice. I am important in this cosmos, uh, and that's what gives me meaning. Divine sovereignty, on the other hand, is realizing that God is sovereign. He brings us to himself. We are dead in our own sins. We need him to activate us, to wake us up, to, to bring that focus. And there's still a tension in that realm. Um, if you go too far in divine sovereignty, you get to hyper-Calvinism. If you go too far to free will, you become Pelagiast uh, in your views. Both of those are heretical in some sense, and we really don't want to go to those extremes. It's interesting that uh, Robertson McQuilkin, a former president of CIU, once said, quote, it is far easier to go to one extreme or the other than to stay in the center of biblical tension. And yet that is where we are called often as Christians to be in that center of biblical tension. And this is one of those uh, aspects of uh, where we need to realize that there's a paradox. There's a tension. We need to live in that and trust God for getting us through. Can we find a balance? I think so. The Bible sets the bounds for paradoxes. Thus, even if we cannot know objective truth fully in this world, we can follow the principles from the revealed truth in the Bible. As Francis Schaeffer said, we can have substantial truth, but not exhaustive truth. 
And we can discern truth from foolishness by the use of the principle of non-contradiction. For balance, then, we need to verify the subjective beliefs with the objective facts. There is that balance. There is that center of biblical tension. And we need to be able to live within that and accept that. History uh, as a record of events is uncertain and unimportant to theistic existentialists, but uh, history is, as a model or type or myth to be made present and lived, at, lived out is of supreme importance. What this means is that theistic existentialism took two steps away from the traditional theism. There's a distrust in the accuracy of recorded history. We don't know. Did that really happen? Doesn't matter. It's what I believe that matters. There's a loss of interest in facts and an emphasis on religious implications or meaning, especially as we've gone through all this um, German higher criticism that's attacked Christianity and, and the theistic existentialism has uh, caused people to throw up their hands and say, I don't know. I, I just have to believe what I believe. And that has been uh, detrimental. You need to pursue the truth. And there are answers. So um, higher criticism really uh, tore at the truth of the message. Uh, if the biblical accounts are not historical, then they cannot be trusted. Uh, this distrust in the historicity of the Bible led to a radical shift in emphasis. So what became important were beliefs and timeless truths and morality, even if they could not be substantiated by actual events. So did Adam and Eve exist? Well, we don't know. But what is the meaning? Well, man had a beginning. Um, there are some important conclusions that we can uh, bring out of that. Did David really kill Goliath? Well, that's a story, good story, you know, good over evil and, and so on. But did these things really happen? Did Abraham uh, actually go to sacrifice Isaac? Did God call him to do that? Well, it's a good story, but it gives us principles. That's what happens when you turn away from the, uh, the, the truth of the gospel, and you have to focus on your own interpretation. So the importance of the disciples' belief in the resurrection was not that it was based on actual fact, but rather that they believed it was true and acted upon this belief, and that's where you end up. This, this led to religion becoming myth, and so Cyrus says this, the doctrine of death and resurrection came to stand not for the atonement of humankind by the God-man Jesus Christ, but for a new life of human service and sacrifice for others. So for the disciples, um, the resurrection was not the true raising of uh, Jesus from the dead, but when they entered Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles six months later, uh, according to one theologian, uh, they had this... Um, epiphany moment of uh, what Christ really taught them about love and how they should love one another. Uh, that is uh, existentialism at the heart. And critics uh, would say this. Theists say that existentialists start with two false presuppositions. Miracles are impossible. The Bible is historistic, historistic. The Bible is historically untrustworthy. Uh, however, recent biblical scholarship has demonstrated that the Bible can be trusted historically. I'm trying to finish up. <laughs> uh, existentialists are building theology on a shifting sand of myth and symbol. There must be an event if there is to be meaning. So that's where this leap of faith comes in. It may create belief in the subjective world, but that does not mean that it is objectively true. And so this reliance on subject Activity may eventually lead a person down the same path, the nihilism, and that's the problem. It ends up in the same place. Sire predicts that both forms will be with us for a long time, so theistic ex existentialism as well as atheistic um, theistic existentialism. Our response to both forms should be to present, well, let me read this. Atheistic existentialism, which in its response to the meaninglessness of nihilism, lifted philosophy from objectivity and created meaning from human affirmation. So it will be with us a long time because it satisfies the naturalists who have turned away from God and still want to find meaning in their lives. Our response to both forms should be to present the historicity of the gospel in the fullness of a vibrant faith 
so that others see the balance between objective reality and subjective truth. So when you look at this uh, chart again, we want to focus on God, not ourselves. Even theistic existentialism, as uh, people have still focused on themselves, they've lost the real meaning of what God brings to them. And so we have to look at this verse as our concluding uh, point. Mark 12.30, as reflects back from the Old Testament, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So this is where we need to be. This is what we need for today.